Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar titled A Multi-Omic Approach to Detection and Characterization of Viral Pathogens and Their Impact to the Immune System. This webinar is part of an ongoing coronavirus virtual webinar series. I'm Susie Valdez of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and sponsored by Fluidime. For more information about Fluidime, go to www.fluidime.com. Now let's get started. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you'd like during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have any trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. As a reminder, this presentation is educational and offers free continuing education credits. Simply click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located at the top right corner of your presentation window and follow the process to obtain those credits. I now present today's speakers, Dr. Andrew Kwong, the Chief Science Officer at Fluidine, and Mr. Bill Hunt, the Director of Microfluidics Product Management at Fluidine. For a complete biography on our speakers, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Bill and Andrew, you may now begin your presentation. Welcome, gentlemen. Good morning. Thank you for joining us today to hear about Fluidime's solutions to the challenges that we are facing with SARS-CoV-2 infection and the health challenges associated with managing patients that are showing COVID-19 pneumonia. As all of you know, this is a very large-scale health issue affecting almost all of the countries worldwide. In addition to the impact, of course, that it has on patients and those infected with this virus. There are significant impacts on first responders, the infrastructure for hospitals, the access and supply of, of PPE, and a dire need for additional tools and tests for detections, as well as therapeutic strategies for treatment of patients that are suffering from this infection. One of the things that we have identified that is important are the rapid and high throughput genetic and epigenetic testing, both for the virus and for host response, uh, immune and serology monitoring of antibodies and how the patient's immune system is responding to the infection. And finally, as part of serological testing, measuring the antibody response uh, to infection or from uh, vaccines to be and serve as surrogate markers uh, for uh, evaluating how we can move people uh, back into the workplace uh, or into a safe place for them to recover. So the technical requirements that are needed for a large number of these molecular diagnostics are really the high volume and the applications both for viral detection and for biomarkers. And these biomarkers can be uh, epigenetic changes to the patient that is infected, or it can be changes in the immune cell population of the individual. The other requirement that is important to address is really maximizing the results from these precious samples. There are a large number of possible molecular tests that one can perform and it's important to be able to perform these tests with a small amount of sample as possible to evaluate the broad breadth of tests that are available. And finally, purely because of the scale of, of testing, there needs to be high cost efficiency in, in testing. So the support that Fluidime is offering uh, in global laboratory efforts in response to this disease is through HyPlex mass cytometry and imaging. This is based on our proven Cytoff technology. Our versatile, scalable microfluidics platforms that can be used for measuring both genetic and 
um, protein changes through our partnerships with different companies and our ability to design flexible panels so that one can very easily add additional biomarkers to existing panels without changing the technology. And really, we offer simplified workflows and automated platforms to improve one's productivity and really driving the return on this investment to answer these critical questions associated with COVID-19. So very briefly, uh, Fluidime offers multi-omic solutions for a comprehensive view of health and different states of disease. It's based on essentially two platforms. The first is mass cytometry, which is illustrated on the top part of this slide. And we have both the original Cytoff technology that was initially established for looking at samples in suspension, similar to what one would see in fluorescent-based flow cytometry. However, with the addition of the technology that Cytoff allows you, basically a mass spectrometry-based method, one can broaden the spectrum of markers that one considers in a study from the few that you can do in traditional fluorescent-based methods for flow to up to 40 to 50 in the case of mass cytometry. With the addition of the Hyperion product, which is an imaging module, works very closely with the Helios, our current mass uh, cytometry instrument, one can also do subcellular imaging of tissues at about one micron resolution with approximately 40 different markers. On the other side of the house, we have our microfluidics platform, which allows for a very flexible and powerful method to look at different uh, genetic and genomic markers within a wide range of clinical samples. And in addition to that, we have our single cell techniques for looking at both uh, changes in the genetics, genomics, and proteins. Both of these are based on our microfluidics technology, which was the foundation of the technology that was developed at Fluidime. So the primary two uh, technologies that we'll be talking about in today's presentation are the use of mass cytometry in immune monitoring and genomics and gene expression studies using our microfluidics platform to evaluate uh, possible uh, infection and epigenetic changes uh, in the uh, patient that has been infected uh, with this virus. First off, we will have a presentation on our microfluidics platforms and how you can use this uh, in the context of research for COVID-19. And uh, Bill Hunt, the director of microfluidics uh, from Fluidime, will be presenting this part of the slide deck where he'll be talking about microfluidic solutions for detection and characterization of human and viral genomes. Thanks, Andrew. So welcome, everybody. Um, as Andrew noted, I'll be presenting the genomics and the microfluidics portion of today's presentation and then pass it back to Andrew for the mass cytometry component of, this, of the presentation. And I'd like to start um, this particular section by acknowledging the rapid pace at which information and the disease is, is spreading um, globally. <clears throat> it started back in the end of December. That, those were the the first cases were reported in Wuhan, China, and it has since spread globally at a rapid pace. Um, the virus has been known by a few names. Um, it seems to be in falling to, it's, we're going with SARS-CoV-2 at the moment, but it's also been referred to as novel coronavirus or um, NCOV-219. For simplicity, I'll just refer to the virus as SARS-2 through today's presentation. And the disease itself is referred to as COVID-19. Um, I also want to recognize the, the vast number of resources um, that have become available with regard to COVID-19 and, and the study of SARS-2. 
Um, I'm using the WHO database as a reference for today's presentation and acknowledge that the numbers are changing on a daily basis, but I do find it as a useful tool to just monitor hotspots in the epicenters of disease at any given moment in time, which the WHO website does a wonderful job doing. Um, but there's also additional resources available, such as Johns Hopkins University and um, CDC. But as you can see, the, the number of infections is now um, it's over 700,000 as of this morning, with over 33,000 deaths. And the country's hit hardest in terms of cases and deaths are from the U.S. at the top of the list, through some uh, countries in Europe, Italy and Spain specifically, as well as Germany. And of course, China has been hard hit by this, by this disease. Moving into the, genetic, um, the, the genetics of SARS-2. So it's classified as uh, the genus beta coronavirus, and it's also the same uh, genus that, is, uh, that contains the original SARS virus that was an outbreak in the early 2000s, as well as the MERS uh, coronavirus that was an outbreak in the 2010s. Um, the genome is a positive sense, single-stranded, polyadenylated RNA with about 30,000 base pairs. And the sequence has been referenced, and it's posted to GeneBank, and the link is shown here on the slides. There are four major structural proteins, including the spike glycoprotein, which has been a target for therapy and vaccines since it is the me mechanism by which the virus enters host cells and, and results in ensuing infection. But there are also targets such as the envelope uh, protein, the membrane protein, and the nucleocapsid. And I show at the bottom of the screen the reference to the three pathogenic strains, the three human pathogenic strains of coronavirus, SARS-1, SARS-2, and the MERS virus, the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome. And they're, they're very close uh, phylogenetically, as you might expect. Moving into um, how Fluidimes products can help in the detection and study of COVID-19. We offer a variety of products, both on the PCR side and on the library prep side. I'll start with the technology that would, would enable screening and detection. So in this case, we're looking at a qualitative result, whether the virus is present or absent. Uh, we can also to look to see if a certain genotype is present or absent. Then you can progress to a quantitative type of an approach, more of a viral load approach that's traditionally used with HIV or perhaps hepatitis C. Um, for means of quantitating how much virus happens to be present in an individual at any given time. And these technology, these methods are all based on PCR assays. Uh, transitioning over to clinical research, there's a lot of work being done in this space at the moment as a lot of information remains to be discovered about this virus, um, such as the viral evolution, so looking at phylogenetic analysis. And there's a lot of work being done on mechanisms of action, such as population stratification, which individuals are succumbing more readily to this virus versus those that have perhaps a healthier immune response and are able to combat the virus more effectively. That's an, an area of interest uh, globally. There's also an interest in the transmission of the virus, its level of virulence, the host, resp host response to the virus or host resistance, as I mentioned, as well as virus susceptibility. What compounds may be developed that can effectively combat and eradicate the virus from um, its host? And for these, uh, there's a combination of, of technologies available to us. We can also use the PCR technologies used for screening and detection, but there's also a lot of work on next generation sequencing. Looking at the Fluidime portfolio of genomic analysis systems, it really occupies four sectors as shown in this slide. We have our instrument system, which is the Juno, which is our universal controller, and it's also used for library prep um, a, a library preparation for next generation sequencing. And then we have our Biomark system, which is our universal qPCR system or universal PCR system. And I'll describe a little bit more about that in an upcoming slide. We have our integrated fluidic circuits, which are the device that is the forum for all of our reactions that are done on fluidine uh, instrument systems. We make reagents that are used with the integrated fluidic systems. And then we have our design service, D3, which can create custom designs for use with our reagent technology. Focusing on the genomics platforms themselves, I mentioned the Juno system is a component um, that's in, that serves multiple purposes. We refer to it as a preparatory system, meaning that it supports library preparation for targeted sequencing, but it's also a universal controller. So by, by that I mean 
so you can take any of Fluidime's portfolio of IFCs and you can load them for processing on the Juno platform. It will accept all of our formats. And that includes formats that are used specifically and solely on the Juno platform, but also those IFCs that can be transferred over to the Biomark system for analysis through uh, qPCR. And that's what's shown in the figure here on the right. So on the Biomark side, the Biomark has our optics and, um, and, and data analysis software that supports gene expression, genotyping, copy number analysis, as well as digital PCR. On the library prep side, on the left side of the slide, we have, um, you can feed our libraries into Illumina systems for purposes of next generation sequencing. And it also supports RNA-seq, which we'll get to in a moment. Since I mentioned the integrated fluidic circuit is a, is a touchstone of our technology, um, it really does, it really is the, the mechanism by which all of our, all of our reactions um, are, are, are realized. So in terms of keeping pace with a virus such a, or a pathogen such as uh, SARS-2, this device is designed to enable automated high throughput workflows with rapid turnaround time. It also allows us to scale throughput without changing technologies in processing up to thousands of samples per instrument per day. And in this particular schem schematic, I'm showing you a 19224 dynamic array IFC. And if you break down the nomenclature of our IFCs, the digit on the left refers to the number of samples you can process in a single IFC run. The digit to the right of the decimal refers to the number of assays or assay pools, as in the case of library prep, that can be performed on the same IFC. The nice feature about these devices is that you can add, remove, or replace assays on demand because the assays are not prefixed or pre-spotted. So that gives a lot of flexibility, for, especially for rapidly evolving pathogens. If you need to add additional primers in the coming weeks or coming months, it's relatively easy to do so with this format. And then the final point is that it, you can analyze multiple pathogenic and control targets simultaneously to identify the source of respiratory diseases that share common symptoms, which is important in the case of COVID-19 since it does share a lot of symptoms with other, other common respiratory pathogens such as flu um, and, and pneumonia. One of the elements of our um, integrated fluidic circuits is, that, is the cost savings. Um, Andrew mentioned the, the importance of trying to control or contain costs when you're testing large numbers of samples in a, in a rapid amount of time. So one of the nice things we do is we compare ourselves to the traditional microtiter plates, which are common tools used in clinical labs around the world. And if you take, uh, if, if you compare one for one, it's possible to generate uh, several thousand reactions with a single IFC. So here we're showing a 9696 dynamic array IFC. So again, 96 samples, 96 assays, um, and they're all tested combinatorially on that platform. And you can test, uh, you can test one IFC to get 96, or, or you can use one IFC to process the equivalent of 96, 96 well plates, or it's the equivalent of 24, 384 well plates. So you're getting thousands of reactions with a single, um, a single run. Our D3 assay design portal is set up to provide custom content um, for a variety of, of targets, including respiratory pathogen analyses. So the, design, the designed assays are specific for coronavirus using publicly available genomic reference sequences and primer designs. You can get the full NCI, NCBI uh, reference sequence as shown in this figure. And we can get, we have targets that are specific to the spike, uh, the spike protein as well as the M, N, and G e-gene sequences can also be targeted. We also can design assays for specific panels of respiratory panel of pathogens. So for example, we have developed, uh, we have received requests for human ortho, ortho pneumonia virus um, uh, subgroup A through NC. And that, that has been generated with our design group and it's publicly available. So to do this, the, the mechanisms to process through D3 are you email the assay design group for assistance, and I show the email link on the screen, or you can contact your local Fluidime sales representative or field application scientist for additional information. Moving into the actual products uh, that go with different platforms, I'll start with our, with our Biomark products, uh, since there's been a lot of interest in rapid testing, um, high throughput screening, and surveillance, and that's how our Biomark system would be used. So in combination with the Biomark, 
you can have our IFCs that support quantitative PCR for rapid detection, giving results in less than four hours. And I, can, I show on the table below the instrument the assortment of IFC formats that are available from the 19224 that I showed previously down to a 4848. Again, 48 samples, 48 assays for each of those 48 samples. It also supports high volume screening, so you can test up to thousands of samples per day with flexible batch sizes. As, as samples come in, you can either scale up from the 48 to the 96 to the 192, depending on demand. And it has the adaptable assay content. I mentioned that you can add, remove, or replace assays on as needed. And that's one of the nice features we, we promote with this device, since it does provide a great deal of flexibility. And this is useful when you're trying to um, develop panels. If you want to add different targets, remove different targets, um, it, it's, it's useful to, to make those exchanges readily. And then you can test, it's being used to test pathogenic strains of coronavirus. If you wanted to look at which strains are pathogenic versus the other strains that are associated more with the common cold versus a wider range of respiratory pathogens that go beyond just the coronavirus. For digital PCR, the instrument also supports digital PCR uh, beyond just the quantitative PCR. And here I'm showing the table with two of our digital array, a digital array um, IFCs the 12 by 765 or the 48 by 770. And these are also useful for sensitive absolute quantitation. So you can get sensitive viral detection using quantitative digital PCR with inline fluorescence detection, supporting up to 12, or supporting up to 48 samples per run with up to 770 partitions per sample. The workflow is very, is very quick. You can get results in less than three hours and it's very flexible. Um, users can prepare one or more sample premixes using gene-specific assays of interest, you, allowing you to either process all samples within this, with the same assay or process samples with different assays. There have been a number of publications on the Biomark platform. Um, the ones I'll show today are applicable since they fall in the same um, area of look, looking at pathogen detection. So this particular paper comes from a group in France that was published in 2018, and the title is Disclosing Respiratory Co-Infections, a Broad Range Panel Assay for Avian Respiratory Pathogens on a Nanofluidic PCR Platform. So I recognize this is a third model, um, but it does show the proof and principle of creating a uh, high throughput screening protocol to detect respiratory co-infection profiles in poultry. So for this study, they used the Biomark HD, they use the HX controller versus the Juno that I talked about earlier, which is specific to the IFC type. So the HX controller is specific to the 9696 dynamic array IFC. And the authors concluded that the protocol enabled development of a high throughput multiplex panel targeting key poultry respiratory pathogens that included virus, bacteria, and fungal targets. So it was proof in principle that the system does support this type of a workflow. Extending this into humans, there was an additional publication that came out in 2016, um, also from a group in France, titled A Novel High Throughput Method for Molecular Detection of Human Pathogenic Viruses Using a Nanofluidic Real-Time PCR System. And in this case, the authors wanted to develop a high throughput method for detecting 19 human pathogenic viruses and controls um, at the same time. And they also used the Biomark HD, and in addition to our dynamic array IFCs, the 4848 in this case, they also use the 48.770 digital array um, IFC, which supports uh, digital PCR. And they concluded that the combined use of real-time PCR as well as digital PCR um, provided high throughput sample screening during an outbreak investigation and surveillance. So that seems definitely applicable in the case of coronavirus. These are the types of things that institutions are trying to do today. So the fact that it's been done before using Biomark, using our reagents, using our IFCs, um, and proof in principle shows how it can be extended and adapted to outbreaks such as COVID-19 or perhaps other outbreaks in the future. I um, there are several other publications. There are actually thousands of publications generated for the Biomark system. Um, I'm focusing today on the pathogen detection applications. So in addition to the two that I highlighted earlier, these are some additional uh, publications that I thought were relevant that might be of interest, specifically noting the last one, which was re relevant to or was applicable to coronavirus. Authors in Turkey were looking at the impact of viral replication 
um, using different plant extracts and found that certain extracts did seem to slow the replication of the virus. So that's something I would certainly want replicated, but it does show how creative and how, we, um, how the biomark system and our reagents and, and products are being used in creative ways to, uh, um, to solve, uh, answer questions and solve unmet needs. We have been engaging with customers to, who have co contacted us with regard to uh, using our products to combat uh, the virus and understand it, uh, conduct surveillance and uh, perform detection. Uh, we announced earlier this month a collaboration with the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, and this was a press release from mid-March. Um, they are leading a consortium to develop real-time PCR tests for coronavirus using the Biomark HD. Uh, they're using the 19224 and the 9696 IFCs, as well as Roche Universal Probe Library products. And their goal is multiplex epigenetic and RNA measurements to support high throughput screening and detection during and post infection. So the goal here is to see if there are targets and biomarkers that will allow individuals who perhaps have not yet uh, um, presented with symptoms, but yet they are infected with virus, if we're able to detect them earlier in the cycle and, and, and get them uh, to the proper level of care. And this is being planned as a submission to the US FDA for the emergency use authorization, and more on this will be coming in the coming weeks um, from, uh, from Mount Sinai. Moving into our library prep um, um, products and solutions, I wanted to start, start out with our Advanta RNA-Seq NGS library prep workflow, which does enable um, SARS-2 analysis. It supports automated walk-away um, walk automation, so it substantially reduces pipetting steps and operator interve interventions using the automated 48-sample workflow that includes solid phase capture of polyadenylated RNA, which the SARS-2 virus is polyadenylated. Um, it offers superior cost savings, allowing you to maximize laboratory budget by minimizing consumption of reagents and consumables using microfluidics technology, and it supports robust chemi chemistry allowing you to confidently generate high-quality, full-length stranded RNA uh, sequ sequencing libraries from a variety of organisms, including SARS-2. To support this workflow, we, we developed a new IFC format, which was introduced um, in 2019 called the 48 Atlas. Um, this IFC format supports solid phase capture and multi-step reactions. So it's it was part of our goal to automate more of the workflow than prior IFCs have done. So, and our goal is to have a continuous evolution and creation of IFCs to, that meet the needs of our users. So in this case, you can see that there are a number of steps that have all been automated on this IFC format. So it truly is walk away um, automation. And for analysis of COVID-19, uh, there have been some papers and publications on this very topic looking at how uh, COVID-19 and the host gene expression changes within the same sample. So in the case of uh, this publication, gene expression analysis uh, was deemed critical to understanding the host immune response to coronavirus infection. The uh, three uh, targeted viruses associated with pathogenic coronaviruses have all, um, they all have positive sense single-stranded RNA genomes with a polyadenylated tail. And because of this, uh, the coronavirus RNA and the host cell mRNA can be profiled together in the same RNA-seq workflow. So an example of this, um, you can see how this might be used for hypothesis-free measurement of phenotypic changes in cells or tissues in response to viral infection. It can also be used for characterization of the immune, uh, the immune cell gene expression in patients at different time points after viral infection. It can be used for characterization of COVID-19 sequence variants and the impact on host gene expression, and finally, identification of immune cell expression signatures that, that correlate with clinical solutions or clinical outcomes to guide treatment options. That concludes the genomics portion of the presentation. I will now pass this back to Andrew, who will present the mass cytometry component of our portfolio. Andrew? Thank you, Bill. So what I would like to share with you is some work that's been done in the area of cytometry in, in COVID-19 research. We've seen over the past few weeks or month or two 
a variety of papers using uh, traditional cytometry techniques that really demonstrates the importance of doing large-scale longitudinal immune cell profiling of individuals that are infected with, uh, with SARS-CoV-2. In a recent commentary published by the president of ISAAC, the International Society for the Advancement of Cytometry, he noted that the starting point for addressing multiple clinical questions will really rely on the ability to deeply characterize the immune system of individuals that are infected with SARS-CoV-2. He showed a small amount of data, which is illustrated on the panel on the right, of a patient that was infected uh, with SARS-CoV-2. And you can see a distinct change in the immune cell profile. While this is very uh, suggestive of the importance of cytometry for COVID-19 research, we've also seen some additional papers where they performed clinical studies and the use of cytometry has uh, unveiled uh, new insights into uh, mechanisms of action and how one can potentially treat the disease effectively. In this paper by Zeng et al. published in Cellular and Molecular Immunology, they were able to demonstrate through the use of cytometry that they could identify the changes in a variety of immune cell populations on a single cell basis. And in addition to elucidating the changes in the immune cell populations, they also had uh, flow cytometry panels that added functional analysis. And so one could look at both the change in the state of the cells as well as the changes in the immune cell populations. Although this study showed the potential of things, there were some um, difficulties in carrying out this study. Because of the large number of parameters, cell populations, and function, they were required to actually analyze the clinical samples from each individual on five different runs in the flow cytometer. This, of course, can lead to biases in the results, and you cannot really uh, necessarily correlate the different cell populations because of the variability of running multiple samples from the same patient due to the variability of these fluorescent-based technologies. What we illustrate here are the five different panels or analyses that were run in this particular study. On the first uh, tube, we illustrate the antibodies that were used uh, for the core part of the panel, which allows one to elucidate the different cell populations. In addition to understanding what the cell populations are, they looked at T cell activation and exhaustion in two separate panels, and then they looked at two other functional panels that were related to uh, cytokine release, which we know plays an important role in the morbidity of this disease. In all of these panels, you see that CD3, CD4, and CD8 had to be included multiple times to allow one to uh, basically align the data. And so this leads to a lot of challenges and some missing information. For example, when you look at the CD45 or the CD56 populations, you don't have the information that's associated with your functional markers or markers uh, of activation or exhaustion. To overcome these particular challenges, if you were to have done, run the exact same assay with 23 unique markers using mass cytometry rather than fluorescent-based excuse me, rather than fluorescent-based cytometry, you would be able to perform the experiment in a single tube, and which would lead to more robust results, leading to different insights potentially, and of course the savings of time and resources, uh, both for the instrument and for uh, the time for doing the analysis. In a very interesting paper that came out of China, they looked at the transplantation 
of ACE2 negative mesenchymal stem cells and how that would impact the outcome of patients with COVID-19 pneumonia. In this paper, they used a very large 36 marker Cytoff panel to aid in understanding the changes to the immune system upon treatment with these mesenchymal stem cells. What they found was that the mesenchymal stem cells transplantation could improve the outcome of the patients and that the unbiased Cytoff analysis because of the large marker panel and in conjunction with the measurement of the eight cytokines, they found that the T and natural killer cell subsets were reduced post-transplantation, as well as a reduction in the populations of the dendritic cells and the regulatory T cells. So this had a very large impact in reducing the cytokine storm, which was uh, leading to a better outcome for these patients that received transplant. What was important is that the systems level analysis was enabled by mass cytometry because of the large number of markers. They were able to actually move this into the clinic very quickly, even though this was a relatively new panel for them because of the simplicity of panel design that is associated with using mass cytometry. So what are the challenges as we look forward into doing larger scale longitudinal immune cell profiling for people and studies that are associated with COVID-19. Well, the first, of course, is panel design. So one of the challenges associated with traditional fluorescent-based methods is that there are combinations of markers and fluorophores that will work together very well, while others will not. For example, it's often difficult to look at both a surface marker and an intracellular marker at the same time. And so the question arises, when I design my panel in order to make this fit into my particular instrument, are there biases that I will have to, or rather assumptions that I will have to make regarding the different cell populations? In addition, with the approach of multiple tubes, you will have the um, trade-offs between a larger number of markers and a larger number of hypotheses that you will test uh, versus minimizing your sample use for other studies, you know, potentially for serology or for studies similar to what Bill described in his previous slides. And of course, processing all of the tubes will take a lot of time and it's not a cost effective nor efficient way of performing these studies. And even the data acquisition may be very doable with a large number of data files that come off of the flow cytometer. That analysis and able to bring all of that data together will be very time consuming. And in the challenges that we're facing with the large numbers and the growing burden of this disease, one needs to be able to generate answers very quickly. We're also seeing the beginning of a lot of multi-site collaborations. We know that there are differences from region to region. And so questions for flow cytometry are how one can enable multi-site collaborations so that we can have data that can not be dependent on site collection. And finally, we have found that a lot of customers are interested in having one or two laboratories in a larger consortium perform the analysis and so there are questions around how does one store samples and how to ship them to the laboratories that will be performing the cytometry analysis. So the solution that Fluidine provides is the MaxPAR Direct Immune Profiling System. This is really a two-piece uh, solution. One is a 30-marker backbone panel. It's lyophilized in a dry single tube format, which is easily customizable, and the staining protocol is very straightforward. Because it's done in a single tube, the requirements are relatively modest in that you only need 300 microliters of whole blood or approximately 3 million PBMCs to perform this very comprehensive profiling of the immune system. It's cost effective and very efficient. As I said, the uh, staining is very, very simple. And then it's a single analysis 
on the Helios mass cytometer. The second part of the system is the MaxPAR path sitter software, which allows one to remove analytical bias and the need for expert dating. This is a end-to-end -end workflow uh, from the 30 marker backbone panel all the way through to the generation of a standardized report. The MaxPAR direct immune profiling system has been demonstrated to have very good consistency from lot to lot, run to run, and between sites. In addition to the study that we initially uh, demonstrated this very good consistency, there have been peer-reviewed papers that also really demonstrate the power of mass cytometry to bring consistency to these multi-site collaborations. We've also seen the ability to stain cells with a MaxPAR direct immune profiling assay and then immediately freeze the samples and then store them up to four months. And analysis after the four months of freezing basically recapitulates the results from the samples that were analyzed uh, initially upon staining without freezing. So the MaxPAR Direct Immune Profiling Lab overcomes many of the challenges associated with traditional flow cytometry by moving to a mass cytometry-based method rather than a fluorescent-based method. It's a very easy workflow. It is very fast to move from sample to answer. You can freeze and ship your samples. And most importantly, as you have a large number of folks that will be performing these multi-site studies, you do not have to have special expertise for the data analytics. In addition to the 37 cell populations that are addressable with the 30 marker backbone panel, we have additional open channels to customize the panel. What's illustrated in green are the availability of additional antibodies from fluidine that you can immediately drop in to the assay as well as the open channels from 105 up to 116 where you can perform uh, custom conjugations of the cadmium metals to your antibodies of choice to allow you to really expand the panel out to well over 40 markers. The MaxPAR path setter software will allow you to customize your assaying so when you add in the additional drop-in markers for either additional cell populations or for understanding cell function, this can be accommodated with a custom workflow solution through PathSetter. To demonstrate the ability to do a multi-site study with MaxPAR Direct, there was a paper recently published in Cytometry Part B where they looked at the variability associated with the MaxPAR direct immune profiling assay, both with PBMCs and with whole blood. And they found that for either of these samples, the coefficient of variation was less than 18%, where it was slightly better in whole blood than it was in PBMCs. That maximal uh, variation was when you looked at the differences across multiple sites, they included six sites for PBMCs and seven sites for whole blood. So this would run on different instruments uh, with different operators and at different times. So the reproducibility of the assay is excellent and will allow for very accurate um, measurements of the changes in the immune systems of patients uh, infected with SARS-CoV-2. Recently, Fluidime has announced the ability to analyze samples uh, for customers through the launch of the Therapeutic Insights Laboratory. This is a full-service laboratory that will allow you to uh, design a particular assay based on the backbone of MaxPAR Direct and have the samples shipped to Fluidime for analysis and a very quick turnaround 
uh, of a full report uh, for use in studies. So the Therapeutic Insights Laboratory allows you to perform both suspension-based mass cytometry experiments as well as imaging mass cytometry experiments. And it allows folks to very quickly bring this technology to their clinical studies, even if there is no access in the group working on these immune profiling studies uh, if, if they don't have an instrument. The MaxPAR Direct Immune Profiling System, we believe, is a very powerful solution for your COVID-19 research needs when it comes to understanding longitudinal immune cell profiling. The systems level panel really reduces bias and doesn't uh, force you to make assumptions or to uh, compromise on the choice of immune cells that you want to look at uh, in the particular studies. There is very good run-to-run -run reproducibility. It maintains the contextual relationship between all of the different subsets and the functional markers and we believe it solves most of the multi-site challenges associated with variability and sample processing for these very large-scale immune profiling studies. So as we know, everyone is challenged in being able to you know, get information. You can learn more about all of the products that we offer, both on the side of the mass cytometry um, product offerings as well as the offerings in microfluidics at our website, uh, fluidime.com. Thank you. And thank you, Andrew and Bill, for that informative presentation. We will now start the Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have any questions you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just simply click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. So let's get started. We have quite a few questions coming in today. I'm going to start with you, Bill. Our first question is actually a two-part question. How long is the process for using the microfluidic platform for detection. And FDA, FDA now has approved five-minute testing for COVID-19 detection for Abbott. How does this system compare to yours? Okay, so I'll start with the first part of it. So our workflows depend, they, they vary depending on the IFC itself and as well as the protocol you choose, the script that's chosen to run the IFC. So we have specific scripts that support um, relatively short turnaround times of just a couple hours. And we have others that have, they go longer, but they're all less than four hours in total. Um, one of the things we promote about our technology is the capacity of throughput. So if you look at our IFC structure, we can go up to 192 samples at a time. And if you're talking about a couple hour um, run, run time, you're able to get thousands of samples in a day. So that's, that's how that number was calculated. For the second part of the question, um, yeah, this is, not a, this is not a point of care test. It's not a five minute test like the Abbott um, test that was developed with the old Allier technology. Uh, but it is, it, it is high throughput and high capacity. Thank you for that. And another question, Bill. Some people are asymptomatic, so the detection kits used now are not perfect to detect low viral load in each individual. So for quantitative viral load, what is the lowest concentration you can detect? That's an active area of, of, of development for us and with our customers. So we've got individuals who are working on viral load applications using our technology. I know that based on other technologies or based on standards, the goal is to get below five copies per reaction. Um, and I know certainly there are, there are tests out there that are going you know, down towards one or perhaps even less than one copy per reaction. So that's the target we are aiming to achieve as well. Thank you for that. And Andrew, this is a question for you. Do the samples all have to be fixed in like smart buffer force 
uh, Sitehoff the service you run? Uh, so no, they do not. Uh, we have the avail We are able to uh, analyze samples that have been stained and then frozen. Uh, alternatively, one can uh, actually stain and then uh, preserve in in something like SmartTube. Uh, we have not uh, tested uh, MDIPA with cells or with blood that have been uh, preserved in in SmartTube before staining. Thank you. And <clears throat> Bill, is I'm I'm going to try to ask, ask this question right. Does that mean we have nine two one six different, uh, or I guess nine thousand two hundred and sixteen different barcodes? Uh, no, it's um. So the, actually, good question. In terms of the numbers, I can see where that number uh, might be a little bit confusing. So the num that that number, the nine thousand, represents the number of reactions. If you're looking at our genotyping IFCs, if you take the one ninety two um, uh, the the 192.24, you can get up to uh, over 9,000 data points per IFC run from that IFC. But on barcodes for library prep, we have up to 1,536 unique barcodes, and that's with dual indexing. Thank you for that. And Bill, does the assay mean a SNP? Uh, yes, if you're looking for a SNP or a single nucleotide polymorphism or a, a, sing, a single variant, a single nucleotide variant, um, yes, an individual assay is designed to target a specific SNP. Thank you for that. And I, I want to thank our audience um, for these wonderful questions that are coming in. What a great conversation. Bill, I'm going to stick with you for a couple more minutes. How is detection of the coronavirus um, possible during the incubation period? So right now, the, the, group at May, um, the group at Mount Sinai is looking at this, and they're trying to put, put together a group of biomarkers, both RNA-based and epigenetic-based, where we're looking at the host's response to the virus being present in the system. So right now, we're trying to understand what the, it's more of an immunological or an immunological response, or perhaps, uh, as I said, an epigenetic response. It might be a methylation change in the host as a result of the virus being present. So those are... Um, in addition to just looking for the virus itself, looking for the direct uh, signature of the virus being its RNA, we're looking at the host reaction to the virus being present. And Bill, what types of microfluidics does this include? Okay, um, I'll, I'll, I'm not totally sure about that question, but I'll, I'll try to answer it the way I think it's being asked. Um, so with our, with our system, um, the microfluidics refers to just the, the structure, the, the, the reaction chambers and the architecture of our, of our devices. So we work with a variety of samples. So if you look upstream of the, of the IFC itself or the integrated fluidic circuit itself, the sample extraction is somewhat agnostic. We've worked with a variety of systems uh, to support uh, the generation of purified nucleic acid, which serves as the input for our, for our reactions. So we have users who are using kits that are commercially available from various vendors um, with a manual operation. We also have larger institutions that have used automated liquid handlers to do sample extraction and sample preparation upstream of the microfluidic device. So um, hopefully that answers the question, but uh, it, it can be a follow-up if, if needed. Sure, thank you, Bill. And um, regarding kits, which kit or protocol is used to extract RNA from the swab? Currently, our, our customers and internally, we're using a variety of commercial products. Um, I know that there's a number on market today, so we're using the same ones that other groups are using. Um, and certainly, you know, we're in, you know, we are interested in sample extraction, so that may be an area we, we, we turn our attention to in the future. Thank you for that. And um, Bill, does the Fluidon technology, can it be used to help to detect very low numbers of viral copies in a person who is starting in developing the COVID-19 disease. Can you explain how? That's a wonderful question that I think our researchers are trying to understand as well. So I, I don't think we're there yet in being able to give a definitive answer about how exactly that will play out, but that certainly is an area of interest in research because the ability to detect the virus quickly will allow for um, better triage of the individual, understanding what to do when you detect 
virus in somebody who's perhaps asymptomatic. Um, that, 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 that I think will be very important information, but it's still yet to be shown uh, to my knowledge. Thank you for that. And I'm going to swing over to Andrew. We've got a couple of great questions coming in for you. Andrew, are there any COVID-19 projects using the Mattel isotope labeled antibodies with mass symmetry? And, um, or is the fluorescent labeling more suitable for this case? Uh, so the, the last example that we gave, uh, the study of the stem cell transplantation uh, the mesenchymal stem cell transplantation with the um, with the ACE2 negative cells. That was actually a cytos study uh, with 36 markers, and so the the large advantage to that was it was actually be able to be done in a single panel, as compared with some of the uh, other examples that we showed where there were fewer markers, 23 versus 36 in this case, and they actually had to run that over five tubes. We believe, in general, there's advantages with uh, metal labeling of antibodies uh, because of the different uh, techniques that are required for performing uh, intracellular staining uh, compared to looking at, at surface markers. And so, uh, and plus with the you know, high degree of plexity, it's uh, much easier to design a panel using mass cytometry with the metal labeled antibodies. Thank you for that. And what is the turnaround time for mass cytometry? Uh, so if you were to use uh, the, if you have access to the instrument, we said it's very uh, easy to actually uh, take your samples, stain, and analyze within a single uh, afternoon. And of course, if you have multiple samples, they would just stack on top of each other. So the, the uh, throughput of the I assay is very high and it's very quick to perform. If one were to send samples uh, to our service laboratory, uh, turnaround time would typically be a few days uh, after uh, we had the, the study design done. Of course, this depends on the number of samples. And the startup time may be significantly longer than that if, for example, um, the investigators required additional uh, antibodies to be optimized for the assay. But if one were to use things in the catalog, it would be a very quick turnaround time to get up and running. Thank you, Andrew. And I'm going to swing back to you, Bill. And again, audience members, thank you for these great questions coming in. What a wonderful interaction we're having. Bill, what is the detection method used in the microfluidic system? We have a variety of chemistries that we support. So um, Fluidime offers a SNP type chemistry, which is a Fluidime developed chemistry for SNP detection. We also offer Delta gene chemistry for gene expression detection. Uh, we also support chemistries from other suppliers. So we have, in, we have users that have applied TACMAN chemistry uh, workflows to our microfluidics. Um, we've looked at uh, chemistries from IDT. And so it's just a matter of uh, once new chemistries become available, if there's enough of a demand, um, and perhaps with collaboration with, with external partners, we can start looking to see how we may adapt those chemistries for use with our microfluidics. Thank you, Bill. And how is this, um, how can this be applied to the broad population? And is um, the cost a limitation to use the technology massively? So the cost part is one of our, we feel it's one of our advantages because we're working at such small concentrations and such small volumes of, of material that the reagent volume is a relative, it, it can be a large cost for many applications. And because we're using such small amounts, that brings the cost of an individual reaction down. Um, our microfluidics also offer high throughput and high multiplex capacity. So we're able to offer users a high amount of results in a single batch run or a single test run Likewise, we offer a lot of a lot of data points for that each of those samples. So I mentioned on our 19224 IFC for an, as an example, each of those 192 samples is interrogated by the 24 assays within the the center matrix of the IFC, and that gets you to the number of data points in total for the IFC run. For our library prep, um, we also have the, it's the same type of combinatorial uh, exercise, but each of those assay inlets represents a pool of assays. And for an individual pool, we can put hundreds of assays in, an, in a given pool. So you can get fairly complex libraries for interrogation by next generation sequencing. 
Thank you. And one more question, Bill. Which epigenetic modifications are being assessed? DNA methylation, oh, I'm sorry, methylation, small RNAs, or high stone modifications? That's the, that's an area that we're waiting for input from Mount Sinai. That's the group that's working on this to, uh, on the application with a consortium of labs that they are affiliated with. So they're the ones who are coming up with the content, and, and we will work with them to produce the assays based on the targets they provide us. Thank you for that. And Andrew, let's come back to you. If an additional antibodies are added to the MaxPAR Direct panel, can the automated software option still be used? Yes, that, that's really one of the nice features of the PathSetter software is that using the backbone of the antibodies in the MaxPAR direct assay, one can very easily uh, add additional antibodies uh, to perform and answer you know, questions related to different cell populations or questions around cell function. In fact, we've recently done this for a customer who added uh, quite a few additional antibodies for their COVID-19 studies. Thank you. And Bill, are the full sequences in NCBI freely available for commercialization? That's a great question. Um, I believe so. Um, it certainly is worth checking before anybody decides to use them. Just I, I don't want to have legal advice over a forum. Um, but I know that a lot of institutions have been publish, publicizing their primers and probes. Uh, the CDC has done so. Um, other institutions around the world have done so. And many labs are using those reference sequences as part of their designs for their laboratory-developed tests, which they either run themselves or perhaps have even submitted as part of an emergency use authorization um, exercise. So it's, uh, it's worth investigating, but I, I believe they are a public forum uh, publicly provided through that forum. And Bill, a couple more questions for you. Um, I'm interested in using your RNA sequence kit to profile virus presence in different cell types. Does your system support a range of sample input amounts in RNA quality? It does. Um, so our kit supports inputs of 10 to 100 nanograms of total RNA. And we've also demonstrated that it, we have really good performance over a range of RIN values. And RIN is the RNA integrity number. And I'm going to swing back to you, Bill. Can I send frozen P, I'm sorry, Andrew. Uh, can I send frozen PBMC samples to the Therapeutics Insight Services and have the MaxPAR direct assay run on them? Uh, yes, you can. Okay. And um, one more question for you, Andrew. Can you provide a copy of the long 2020 paper? Um, actually, if you go to the uh, website uh, for the journal, which is Aging and Disease, I believe uh, that you should be able to access the article from the journal itself. Thank you so much. And I, we have time for about two more questions, and I'm going to um, swing back over to Bill. Bill, the techniques mentioned in slide six are used for every single sample from each person, or are they only a subset of samples? So the uh, I have to, I'd have to go back and look at slide six. Um, if, I'm, I'm presuming that's the the slide with the microfluidics, uh, but if it's the way our, our microfluidics are structured, yes. oh. uh, it's a multi-omic question, Bill. Oh, okay. Um, can you repeat the question? Then I, I I misinterpreted it. Sure. The techniques mentioned in slide six are they used for every single sample from each person, or only a subset of samples? I wonder if this, this may be a question for Andrew then. It's not, a, it's not really a microfluidics. Right, so I, I think that the, the answer to the question is you know, we're not necessarily proposing that you know, every sample be analyzed you know, both with, uh, through, with microfluidics or with, with mass cytometry. It really depends on, on the questions that you're asking. So clearly for a lot of the things that, that Bill presented on the, on the detection side, you know, he talked about the advantages of 
our microfluidics platform for doing things uh, in high throughput at relatively low cost. You know, for questions around uh, you know therapeutic stratification, uh, disease progression, when one's interested in immune profiling, mass cytometry would be you know of particular interest. And of, of course, the genomics platforms can be used for looking at changes in viral load, uh, for the epigenetic changes that are associated with um, the, the changes in the immune system. And so I think it really depends on the questions that one is trying to address um, as people are, are looking at uh, treatment and detection and, of course, progression of the disease. Thank you. And thank you, both of you, Andrew and Bill, for your time today and your important research. Um, I've, do you have any final comments you want to provide the audience members before we close today? Sure. Uh, we'd I, like I, to. I, I, go ahead, Andrew. Go ahead. No, Bill, go. No, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I, I appreciate everybody getting up and participating in this. I, I, these forums are incredibly important nowadays um, in light of everybody sheltering in place and not having access to face-to-face -face interactions, um, which we're accustomed to and I think many of us enjoy. So being able to reach out and have this kind of engagement through virtual means is a wonderful new tool for this space. And I hope that everybody stays safe um, um, ongoing. And Andrew? I'm sorry? I'm sorry, did you want to also say anything? Oh, yeah, I just wanted to thank everyone for uh, attending uh, today's presentation. And uh, we're happy to answer uh, any additional questions that you have. I know we weren't able to uh, answer all the questions that came in, so we will try to uh, respond uh, to all of you. And uh, we're very excited to be you know, playing our part in trying to um, address uh, this, this crisis in uh, what we're seeing worldwide. And thank you again, both of you, for your time today and your important research. Before we go, I'd like to thank our audience members for joining us today and for their interesting question and encourage you to go and interact in the booth. I'd also like to thank our sponsors, Fluidine, for sponsoring today's webinar. Join them in their booth today. Questions we do not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. And this webcast can be viewed on demand through the end of the year 2020. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share this email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. And next, until next time, bye-bye.